Hey everybody, this is Mr. Mobbin coming at you with another A Push video. This time we're taking a look at topic 9.4, a changing economy. Uh, this uh, topic is kind of broken down into a couple of different components. Uh, this first component is going to be taking a look at the uh, domestic issues surrounding the Bill Clinton presidency of the 1990s. So let's talk about how Bill Clinton will uh, end up becoming the 42nd president of the United States. Now, uh, Clinton is going to be uh, a, a kind of a rising star or had been a whoops, had been a rising star on the Democratic Party for a little while. Uh, he became the youngest governor in Arkansas history in 1978, uh, serving as governor for, I believe it was around, I don't know, about 12 years, actually. Um, and he is going to be, you know, nominated by the Democrats in part because he's going to be viewed as a centrist, uh, you know, a kind of the moderate ideological Democrat uh, in an attempt to try to win over some of the folks that used to vote Democrat in the South but had voted uh, Republican the last few elections. Uh, of course, George H.W. Bush is going to be the incumbent uh, president from the Republican Party seeking a second term for himself and a fourth consecutive re uh, Republican victory. But there is going to be a wild card in this race, and that's going to be coming from Texas, uh, and that is going to be in the form of Ross Perot. Uh, Ross Perot was a self-made billionaire uh, through the uh, Texas Instruments Company and uh, other investments, uh, but Ross Perot is going to be a popular character because he's going to be kind of making the, you know, the, uh, the argument that there really isn't too much difference between the Democrats in, and the Republicans from a kind of a common working man populist perspective. Uh, and even though Perot was, you know, the wealthiest guy of the three, he is going to be appealing more to the, kind of the blue-collar America uh, than any of them. Ross Perot is going to be uh, making some strong arguments about there being too much government debt and too much uh, globalization in the economy, leading to the loss of American jobs. Now, Perot being so wealthy, would be able to self-fund his own campaign and even be able to uh, pay for 30-minute blocks of national television, primetime television time, to be able to you know, promote his candidacy. Uh, so, in many respects, Ross Perot is going to be seen as the, you know, one of the, you know, more, one of the stronger third-party candidates in American history. And he will draw from both traditional Democrats and Republicans, but he, on Election Day, he will be drawing a little bit more from Republicans than Democrats. Now, normally, if you are the incumbent president, you have a pretty you know, pretty good built-in advantage. You have a, you know, a track record you can kind of, you know, uh, you know, rest on to show off to prospective voters. And in the case of George H. W. Bush, you know, there's quite a resume there. You know, he uh, is going to be overseeing the end of the Cold War in America's uh, favor. Uh, we're going to be seeing America uh, win its first military conflict since Vietnam with the Persian Gulf War, with uh, about as when going about as perfect as it could possibly go. Uh, so he's got a lot there. And, he, and in fact, he's going to have a popularity of close to 90% in early 1991. Now, how could you possibly lose with that kind of a resume? Well, as the Clinton campaign said in 92, it's the economy, stupid. Uh, for the Bush campaign, we're going to be seeing an economy set in in late 91 that's going to have a major, major negative effect on the Bush uh, campaign. Uh, when this recession hits, unemployment is going to be going up and, you know, we're going to be seeing government spending going up to try to, you know, uh, you know, deal with the situation economically happening in the country at the time. And to try to rein in what we're now uh, new record budget deficits, even bigger than what we saw under Reagan, George H.W. Bush is going to be pressured by Congress to do something that he said he would never do. On the 1988 campaign trail, he made the uh, the pledge to 
uh, create no new taxes. He said, read my lips, no new taxes. And that's going to help him win in 88. But now in 91, he's going to have to approve tax increases to help offset the growing budget deficit. And for many Republicans, uh, this is going to make him look like a traitor. Uh, he, he's going to look like someone that was a, just a bald-faced liar on the issue of taxation. So, you know, somebody that you could argue had as good of a foreign policy record as you could possibly imagine uh, is going to be undone by domestic issues. So the Bush campaign is going to be in free fall in 1992. Perot is going to be stealing a lot of votes as well. And that's going to put Bill Clinton uh, in prime position to, you know, basically steal an election, uh, you know, from what should have been uh, a fairly easy re-election bid for George H.W. Bush. On election night, you can see here the results. Now, it kind of has an interesting checkerboard uh, look to it, but you'll see that Clinton uh, is going to look, at least on paper with the Electoral College, have a pretty decisive victory over George H.W. Bush. Uh, but he's only going to win 40% of the popular vote. That's it. So the vast majority of Americans did not vote for Bill Clinton in 1992. Now, you might be looking at this and go, well, hey, where's the Ross Perot Electoral College votes? Well, Ross Perot ran a very good campaign, uh, and he picked up 20% of the popular vote, which is extraordinary for a third-party candidate, but he never got the most votes in any single state. And because in all but two of the states, uh, you have to be the popular vote winner of that state to get all of the Electoral College votes, or any Electoral College votes, uh, Ross Pro got shut out on election night, but his campaign, plus with the economic problems going on, uh, is going to play a role in sinking Bush's attempt to win a second term. And then bringing Bill Clinton, the uh, kind of the uh, dark horse candidate, uh, into the White House, the first Democrat victory uh, in a presidential election since 1996. Now, when we start talking about the, uh, the Clinton... Uh, presidency, when we talk about some domestic issues, there are going to be some noticeable accomplishments. Uh, first off, there's going to be the passage of the Family Medical Leave Act. What this does is guarantee for the first time that somebody can leave their job due to medical reasons for themselves or an immediate family member. Uh, could be a pregnancy or having to, you know, uh, stay home with a sick uh, parent or something like that. And be able to have your job and, and leave that job for up to one year and have that job guaranteed for you when you come back. Uh, it's not a paid leave uh, like it is in just about every other country in the world, but it is going to be a step at least in guaranteeing that your job is not taken from you. Uh, another very important bill, uh, seen as an accomplishment by the Clinton administration, but is going to be viewed also as very controversial. Uh, is the passage of the Brady Bill. The Brady Bill is going to be sponsored by Jim Brady, uh, who was the former press secretary for Ronald Reagan and who had been paralyzed following the assassination attempt on, the, on President Reagan in 1981. Well, since that incident, Brady became a uh, committed individual to regulating the gun industry and was a believer that if you had more regulations on guns, you would have far less gun violence. And so what this Brady Bill will do when it will be passed into law is going to outlaw uh, the use of um, many uh, semi-automatic rifles across America. Uh, it's going to be implementing a number of background check requirements. Uh, and, you know, still to this day, uh, the most significant gun restriction law that we had had in the last 30 years now, the Brady Bill will only stay in effect for 10 years. It will not be uh, re, uh, re-approved, uh, but it will be seen as a, uh, a sign from those on the liberal side that guns are an issue that, or guns are an, uh, an item that need to be regulate for, regulated for public safety. But for many on the right, many for, for many conservatives, the Brady Bill is an indication that the government is coming to take your guns. And in many respects, this is kind of the first shot fired, not to be punny, in what is going to be to this day a major battle over, uh, you know, Second Amendment gun rights. Uh, another important uh, accomplishment is going to be the passage of the Motor Voter Bill. Uh, what the Motor Voter Bill is going to do 
is uh, require that uh, DMVs, Departments of Motor Vehicles across America, uh, ask people when they are applying for a license or renewing a license uh, if they want to be registered to vote. Uh, the idea behind that is to increase voter registration. If you're not registered to vote, you're not allowed to vote on election day. Uh, and it has had a noticeable effect. We'll see registration rates go up about 20% as a result of that innovation, and that's still around to this day. Uh, we're also going to be seeing the uh, Clinton administration uh, taking steps to, uh, you know, uh, try to balance the budget. And note, Clinton doesn't run on promising uh, no new taxes. You know, he's going to be smarter than George H.W. Bush on that, but he is going to be, to some degree, a moderate. You know, his goal is to balance the budget. And it is going to be done in the form of spending cuts and increases in taxation. Uh, now, note, by the time we get into 1993, that recession that had dogged the Bush administration had kind of gone away. And as we get into the mid-90s, we're going to see an exploding economy, a massive boom in the economy, the biggest boom America uh, has ever seen. And, of course, that's going to be tied in with the mainstreaming of the Internet. So as the economy just roars into full effect, uh, the government doesn't have to spend as much money because there's not as many people needing welfare assistance and things like that. And if more people are making more money, that's more income that the government can tax. So you are starting to see the groundwork for what is going to be something pretty remarkable. Uh, you are going to see budget deficits decline uh, in the first few years of the Clinton administration. Now, that being said, uh, the Clinton administration is going to be facing some major challenges politically from the Republican Party. One thing that is not listed under early accomplishments for the Clinton administration is going to be uh, the creation of universal health care. Uh, though that will be a major fight by the Clinton administration. In fact, First Lady Hillary Clinton uh, had been put in place of trying to spearhead this uh, attempt to try to get passed through Congress universal health care, where the government would be funding the cost of all uh, medical care, something that almost all Western nations have, uh, but not in the United States. Now, this is going to be a very controversial decision. And going all the way back to Truman, the idea of universal health care, uh, you know, as something that could happen, has really divided Americans. And in this very intense push to try to get it happen in uh, 1993 and 94, uh, there will be considerable pushback by Republicans uh, and many folks uh, associated with uh, interest groups in the medical industry, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the bid to try to get universal health care fails for Clinton, but the bigger effect on this is galvanizing Republicans in fear of when you couple the uh, the attempt at universal health care with the Brady Bill and some other things. The set the sentiment is that you know the Clintons are more liberal than what they had appeared to be. At least that's going to be the the assumption, and that the government uh, was. Uh, becoming too invasive in our personal lives. It was too corrupt, yada, yada, yada. And this is going to lead to the rise of uh, a very significant Republican figure in the 1990s, though he'll never become president. And that man is uh, right here, Newt Gingrich. And in our next video, we'll start off by talking about how Gingrich and Republicans will take back control of the House of Representatives for the first time in 40 years and prove to be a thorn in the side of Bill Clinton, but at the same time, a critical piece in doing something that today seems utterly impossible, creating not just reduced budget deficits, but actual budget surpluses. We'll see you next time.